Please be seated. Well, for the, those of you who are newer to Grace Bible Church, or maybe you're visiting for the first time, my name is Josh Kelso, and I'm one of the pastors here at Grace Bible Church. My family recently went through and has been navigating a significant trial over the last five months. And this trial has extended far beyond us and our family and to many others, including the life of this church. And the elders are allowing and have encouraged me to spend a few weeks to give testimony to the goodness of God and how he has sustained us over these last several months in this season. So I'm going to be giving testimony to God's faithfulness in a series that I've named The Divine Provisions of a Good God. The Divine Provisions of a Good God. And I put my outline and the various passages that I'll be referencing on the uh, website. So if you'd prefer to just listen this morning, uh, we're going to be jumping around quite a bit. And you can find those references online if that's helpful for you. This week, we're going to look at the divine provision of the Word of God. As we consider these divine provisions, I'll be teaching over three weeks, and the first week this morning, we'll be looking at the divine provision of the Word of God, and the next week, we will look at the divine provision of the body of Christ, and we'll then celebrate Easter together, and on April 11th, I'll wrap up with the divine provision of the hope of eternity. And my plan is to walk through some of the last five months, and what my desire is, is that I would be able to testify to the reality of these provisions, the faithfulness of God and what he grants to his children in the midst of trials, in the midst of suffering and hardship. A dear fellow pastor reminded me recently of Psalm 96, verses 3 and 4. It says, Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the peoples, for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. And that is my heart. That is Julie, my wife's, and my greatest desire in all of this is that God would be glorified. The Lord has done good. He has only done good. He has dealt bountifully and benevolently with us. He is great and greatly to be praised. He alone is to be feared and no trial, no hardship, no struggle, no turmoil, no change of life plans are to be feared. God alone is to be feared. For he is sovereign and wise and righteous and good. These are unchanging realities of God. The reality of the situation is that there is no better place for my family to be than where the Lord has us today. And wherever you find yourself today, if you are in Christ, whatever bad news you have received, whatever difficulty you are navigating, whatever ailment you are navigating, The Lord is good. He is faithful. And there's no better place than where he has you at this moment. And what's incredibly sweet and such an expression of the kindness of the Lord is that he did not leave us in our trials, in our difficulties, in this life to navigate them alone. He's given to us, he's granted to us divine resources that express the reality that he is unequivocally good. He is completely faithful. We have received tremendous, tremendous care. Could not imagine a family being cared for better than how we have been cared for in the midst of difficulty and trial. God has been so kind to us in this care. Family, neighbors, friends, believers from other churches, people in other states and countries, you all exemplary in your care for us. And I don't want to minimize the multitude of ways that the Lord has preserved and sustained us through the kindness and care of so many. 
It truly has been astonishing, yet he has provided divine resources to us in our sorrow. These are resources that are only reserved for the believer. Supernatural. Resources that if you're not in Christ, you do not have access to these in the same way. The Lord has given to us supernatural resources, divine provisions in our hurt, in our hardship, in our suffering, and his provisions are generous and more than enough for us to not only get through this season, that's never been the goal, that we would just get past this. There, I don't think really is getting past this. We want to thrive spiritually. We want to glorify God. We want to worship him And by God's grace, I believe we have, and it's only by his grace. And so what we want to do is we want to testify to his goodness and his faithfulness as we reflect specifically on his divine provisions. On October 12th of last year, our belief in these realities was put to the test. Late in the afternoon on that Monday, the Lord in his wisdom, love, and righteousness took my family on a path we never would have imagined. Our family had been vacationing at our family ranch, as we do often, and we were packing up to go home, and a tragic accident took place. While Asher and Elijah, our 13 and 11-year-old boys, were helping me load up into my truck a quad that needed some work done down here in the valley, Kyla, our sweet nine-year-old daughter, who was eight, she was a couple weeks away from nine at the time, was standing by, and Caleb, our little five-year-old, was bottle flipping with a water bottle on a nearby trailer that wasn't hooked up to anything, it was just off to the side, and he was doing that and watching. Caleb quickly ran over, wanting to help, which was common for our sweet boy, and he helped place a strap along the back of the quad in the truck. Once we'd finished, Asher went inside the house, and Kyla and Elijah went behind us to a pasture where there were some cows, and there was a calf that was born that night before. I finished a few things up, and then made my way from behind the truck into my truck. And as I thought Caleb had gone with Elijah and Kyla, as I pulled my truck forward to get closer to the house to continue loading up, I inadvertently ran over Caleb. At first, I thought it was just one of the many large rocks on the dirt path up to the house, but quickly realized that while there are many rocks on the dirt driveway, there usually weren't any that close to the house. My first thought was, I hope I didn't run over the dog. All of these thoughts rushed through my head in less than a second, and then as I quickly jumped out of my truck with panic, I saw my precious little Caleb laying there on the ground. Quickly scooped him up, and crying out his name, I ran to the house, pleading for Julie to call 911, and through tears, I explained to Julie what had happened, and I began administering CPR. As we stayed on the phone with the 911 operator, she helped walk us through CPR, although Julie and I both have been CPR certified in the past, so it wasn't new to us. We instructed our kids to wait inside, which they did, and on their own accord, realizing the seriousness of the situation, they together, the three of them gathered in one of the bedrooms of the house, and they each prayed. As we waited for medical personnel, we continued to work on Caleb's lifeless body, We didn't know in the moment, um, but in hindsight, it's clear that he passed very quickly, immediately, which is a grace from God. As I would do chest compressions, all I could muster was the cry, I know God is good. And in that moment, years of reading my Bible, theological training, pastoral equipping, all summed itself up in that moment where I was confronted with really the most catastrophic moment of my life as I realized my utter helplessness more intensely than ever before and as the terror of having brought about the passing of of my precious son. All that came out was, I know God is good. (laughs) 
And so I cried out that refrain over and over. And in that moment, I did not need to be persuaded of this truth. And when circumstantially I might be tempted most to not believe that reality, a life of exposure to God's word came out in a simple statement, I know God is good. I'm not going to blow many scholars away with the statement, I know God is good. Until that statement comes out when your child is taken from you in a moment. Until that moment when you are the providential means of bringing about the passing of your five-year-old son. In that moment when your feelings are most likely to betray you, what you believe, what you have believed up to that moment about the supernatural provision, the divine provision of God's word and what it says matters. It matters. Everything in your life leading up to that moment when you have shepherded your heart to believe what you have shepherded your heart to believe significantly impacts that moment. I didn't have, con- I didn't have time to contemplate the details of the situation and then come to some sort of determination as to my personal evaluation of the circumstances and whether or not they testified to the reality of God's goodness. It was a moment where the Spirit of God was working in a shattered heart. I know what God has revealed in His Word. I know God's faithfulness, and I know what God has done in the gospel, and in that moment of tragedy, it does not change those realities. They are stable. They are a foundation for the heart, for the soul. I know God is good. How could I know this? How could I know that in such a moment? It's not because of something found within me. It's not some internal strength that I mustered up in the moment. It is only through the divine provision of God's word. The Bible When all stability circumstantially was lost, the Bible, Scripture, God's truth, God's word brought all things into perspective and grounded us on what was true, what is true. And it's tragic that some want to minimize the importance of or even look down upon comprehensive and tightly held conclusions of what Scripture reveals. As if it is divisive or arrogant to firmly hold to a specific theology or truth from Scripture, and certainly there is a way to be arrogant in how you hold to truth and how you hold to anything. But what I know to be true about God What I know to be true from God's word, as I was holding the lifeless body of my five-year-old son, it saved me. If I did not know what I know about God's sovereignty, about God's character, about God's faithfulness, if I did not know what I know from God's word about eternity, my life would look so different. My sanity, my marriage, if Julie, if Julie was not fully persuaded that there are ultimately no accidents, but there is a sovereign God who is good and righteous and loving and is orchestrating every single event, who knows where our lives would be right now? What did this confidence in God's word do for us? Well, while it was a tragic accident from our perspective, because of what we know to be true about God revealed through his word, we know it was a divinely orchestrated event. A million details could have gone differently that day that would have led to a different outcome. And yet this was God's good plan for us. And while most things changed from a personal and familial standpoint for us in that moment, there is something that did not change. God did not change. 
God was not trustworthy up to that moment, and then in that moment of tragedy, something shifted about God. God was no less faithful. But that's often the temptation. We believe something about God when our life is fitting into the categories we have for what is good. But what about when everything changes and those good categories that you hold to get turned upside down? Well, God is no less sovereign. He's no less wise. He is no less benevolent. In fact, the circumstances that might tempt one to doubt is unquestionably a demonstration of those very realities that are true of God. Caleb's passing is an active expression of God's faithfulness and goodness. We believe that fully. Why? Because that's what Scripture would reveal about God. And so we can have confidence in this. God is faithful, God is good. And listen, whatever is going on in your life, if you are a child of God, because we're not the only ones who have experienced difficulty in this life or even this season. Hardship, struggle, trials, sickness, broken relationships. We all are going through such things in some way at some point in time, and yet God is faithful. And if you are going through something particularly difficult right now, whatever is going on in your life, if you are a child of God, you can have full confidence, full conviction that those circumstances demonstrate and don't detract in any way from the reality that God is good. That all his ways are right. That he is fully in control. And listen, no planet, no one else on the planet can have a more trustworthy conviction than the believer who is trusting in God's word. What would cause a woman, a mother, a wife who two days after her baby is taken from her in a moment. She had no goodbyes. No final hugs. No last words. Yet only days after to say, I miss Caleb more than words can describe. And I never would have chosen this path. But I am content. I trust God. And five months later, still with sorrow unimaginable, the same refrain of, honey, I hurt for you and I wish there was more I could do to help you and the burden that you bear. She's speaking to the reality that I did it, that I ran over Caleb and she so compassionately aches with me in that. Yet I am thankful because I know this was the perfect plan for Caleb and is the perfect plan for Asher and for Elijah and for Kyla, and for me, and even for you. It's hard and not fun, but I'm thankful. What can bring that kind of perspective and clarity to this kind of moment, this kind of pain, this kind of hurt? Again, it's not a testimony to us. We are nothing We have nothing to bring to a circumstance like this but sin. But the Spirit of God, working in a shattered heart, using the truth of God's Word, there is power. This is a supernatural provision. It's an unshakable provision, and it's a provision of the truth of God's word being used by God's spirit. And what I want to do is spend some time sharing some summary statements of God's word and how God has used his word in our lives. This isn't all that's true, obviously, of God's word, but this is a summary of just some things on our heart of how God has used this divine provision in our lives over the last four, uh, five months. So first, number one, and again, this outline is on the website if you want to pull it up there, 
uh, later or whenever. But number one, God's word reveals what is undeniably true. God's word reveals what is undeniably true. Since Caleb's passing, there have been many instances where I have desired an answer as to how this could have happened. How did I miss it? Our first trip back to the ranch just a few weeks after I positioned my truck where it was when we loaded up the quad and I sat inside just to see what I could see. (laughs) How far could I see? Turn in your Bible to Psalm 135. We don't know exactly what happened. No one saw the accident, which is a tremendous kindness of the Lord that no one had to witness it. And we don't know if Caleb was bottle flipping in front of the truck or if he had dropped something and went to grab it. But those details, answers to those questions would not bring comfort. They're simply curiosities. Yet the word of God satisfies every curiosity with an answer that actually brings peace, that actually brings comfort, contentment, and listen, even joy. I marveled the day after Caleb passed that there was joy in my home and not a light-hearted giddiness. It's, it wasn't anything like that, but there was joy in our home the very next day. Consider Psalm 135, verses 5 and 6. Oh, I forgot to turn there. (laughs) For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases. Just stop for a moment. Just think about this. Whatever the Lord pleases. He does. Where? Everywhere. In heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all deeps. There is no place in all of existence that is out of the reach for God to do all that he pleases. This situation did not catch God off guard. God is great and above all gods, and whatever he pleases, he does. There is no place and no moment out of God's reach, and if some other plan, if some other set of events would have pleased God more, he could have and would have brought it to pass. Tell me something, anything that can bring greater comfort than that reality. This was not a rogue instance of neglect. Or carelessness. God was fully involved in this moment. And what is best is what took place. That is God's wisdom at work. Turn to Colossians 1. I preached this passage last summer, which is such a kindness of God for it to be so closely on my heart in the midst of this season. Do you remember this? Verse 16, for by him, speaking of Jesus, all things were created both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all All things hold together. Oh. While questions about how this happened and what was Caleb doing and how did I miss it and those types of curiosities, which even if answered, don't bring ultimately a comfort, this truth brings comfort. Why? Jesus created the elements that make up the dirt below Caleb. The elements that make up my front right tire are and were being held together by Jesus. There are no rogue molecules, and if there was a better path or a different outcome that God desired, he could easily, easily could have made it so, as if it were nothing. And not only this, but even in this tragedy, he is causing it to work for good. There's purpose for it. Knowing what happened, 
cannot bring comfort like the reality of the promise that God has a purpose for this and he is using it for good. Caleb being run over by his dad at five years old was not a vain death. You'll hear me repeat that throughout this series. There is such comfort knowing that Caleb's passing wasn't just a random accident. You most likely know it well. Consider Romans 8.28 that we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Caleb's passing has purpose and meaning. It was a divinely orchestrated event and God is using it. He is causing it to work together for good to those who love him. And Caleb's death was not only for my benefit or my family's, but for this church and beyond. For their good, for our good. How would I know this if it were not for God's word? And what else could give this kind of hope and peace? And what in this world could possibly bring this kind of comfort to a broken heart? To know this truth in this circumstance, is infinitely better than a child that lives to old age and never knows Christ. To know that God is using this tragedy to conform his people more into the image of his son. Praise God. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed is the name of the Lord. That's why we can embrace that refrain. And that's why we do embrace it. God was pleased to crush his son to bring about sinners into conformity to his son. How much more can I trust God with the crushing of my son that it, although differently, different, obviously, than Christ's death, will be used by God for his glory? It is this reality that demonstrates the truth of James 1, verses 2 through 4, where James says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. This trial falls into this category, that we are commanded to consider joy. Why? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect. Or if you remember when we went through James, that's mature Brought to its intended end, like a ripe fruit that is just perfect. That's what that word means there. It's, it's mature or ready, brought to its intended purpose, and complete, lacking in nothing. I told Smed a few days after Caleb passed that I understand better what it means to let endurance have its perfect result. We were taking each day at its own, just, okay, consider this joy. Consider this joy. What is God going to be pleased to do? And then as we yielded to the Lord, we watched him grow us and mature us and strengthen us in supernatural ways as endurance was having its result in us. And undoubtedly, we still have a long way to go. But the Lord has been so kind to use this event to make us more like Christ. What else would we want? What else could we hope for or ask for? He's conforming the believer through their trials more and more into the image of Jesus. Think about that. Whatever trial you are in right now, Christian, God's using it. It's not a vain trial. It's not a useless difficulty. God is divinely using it in you to make you more like Jesus. And to be made more like Christ is better than anything else. He's conforming the believer through their trials more and more into the image of Jesus. And God was and is using Caleb's passing to this end. What what more could we ask for? What more could a father want in the life of his son than for his son to glorify God. Caleb's short life on this earth is being used to glorify God. 
Blessed is the name of the Lord. We have no right to demand of God what that must look like. The very fact that he is doing that is an immense privilege and gift from God that we get to know and observe and watch unfold. And yet the thought, couldn't I be just a little less holy and have my son, was definitely one that came into my mind. Wouldn't it be better if I hurt less and was just not as sanctified? The temptation to think that would be better was and is ever-present, and yet, thankfully, as we know, with every temptation, the Lord provides a way of escape. And the Lord has been so kind. You get a little insight into my head. That thought creeps into my head, and I rebuke myself. No, Josh, it's not. It is better to be more like Christ. God is wise. You are not. Don't trust in your own thoughts about this circumstance. What has God said? What is true from God's word? And the Lord has sustained us in that. Listen for a moment, or go ahead and turn to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 67. You want to see God's goodness at work through his word and through trials? Psalm 119, verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. Jump down to verse 71. It is good for me that I was afflicted that I might learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Jump down to verse 75. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Oh, may your loving kindness comfort me according to your word. To your servant. God is not distant from our trials. He's not absent in our suffering. He is using it. And even at Caleb's memorial, the the pour of my heart, the outcry of my heart, was an acknowledgement and a gratefulness at the reality that I have never hated sin more and the effects of sin on this planet than when Caleb passed away. That's a gift from the Lord to have such a distaste for sin. And I did not have that distaste to the same degree as after after Caleb's passing. What we find is that it is far better to hurt on the road to godliness than to find reprieve in godlessness. When emotions are high and hurt is deep and sorrow abounds, God's word is a solid foundation that reveals what is undeniably true. Next, number two. Number two, God's word reveals that God is trustworthy. We find what is undeniably true in God's word, but we also see that God is completely trustworthy. God's word reveals that God is trustworthy. I didn't have time to go search out and come to a determination as to the trustworthy nature of God in that moment. But a life of resolve to know the God of Scripture fortified us both. Julie and I, we knew what we believed about God prior to Caleb's accident. And that shone forth when tested with our trial. We weren't the first to experience a difficult trial, and we won't be the last to experience a difficult trial. Yet God's faithfulness is everlasting. Consider Isaiah 25, verse 1. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will give thanks to your name, for you have worked wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. Perfect faithfulness. God has a plan beyond any moment. 
He has plans formed long ago. And he executes his plans with perfect faithfulness. I make a lot of plans in my life. And very, very, very rarely do things go according to plan. Especially if it involves fixing something in the house. Multiple trips to the hardware store. Multiple additional things broken. It, it doesn't go well. But God's faithfulness to his plans are always executed perfectly. Perfect faithfulness. This reveals that God is trustworthy. If all we looked at was any one moment, we would be tempted to despair, right? Every single one of us in this room, if we looked at single, singular moments in our lives without the perspective beyond that moment, of course we'd be tempted to despair. And yet what we see in Scripture, what we see revealed from God's Word is that He is trustworthy in those moments where we don't see clearly, where we don't see entirely. As we watch God, time after time after time, He demonstrates His faithfulness and we see that God is supremely trustworthy regardless of how we feel at any one moment. Time after time, Hardship, turmoil, struggle, difficulty. Give it time, and God is faithful, always. Which reveals that he was always faithful, even when it didn't appear so. If you're still in the book of Psalms, turn over to Psalm 77. highly encourage you, just go read the whole psalm later this afternoon. It will be good for your soul, but we'll look at verses 11 through 15. The psalmist writes, I shall remember the deeds of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your work and muse on your deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your strength among the peoples. You have by your power redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw you. Oh, oh, I'm just going to keep going and reading. It's all good. (laughs) It's so good. God is faithful. He has done these things. We must meditate on his wonders of old. As the end of verse 11 and verse 12 says, Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your works. As we do that, we see the faithfulness of God. Just open your Bible from the first page to the last, and you see that God is undeniably trustworthy. Watch God care for his people. From Job to Abraham to Jacob to Moses, the nation of Israel, David, time after time after time, where any one moment of history, you might be tempted to despair. Yet as you watch God masterfully work as man intends things for evil. You see God use it for good as we see at the end of Genesis, right? In Joseph's life. Not once does something veer from God's perfect execution of his will. And when Caleb died, we didn't go over our entire Bible in the next few days to believe that. To believe that God was trustworthy. We didn't get from cover to cover in mere moments. Two decades of having God's word opened before us in this church and taught to us week after week faithful preaching of God's word. Thank you, Scott and Smed and others. Encouragement, accountability, biblical fellowship, multiple times participating in Build and West Wellspring, pastoral training in our local church, small group studies together, countless conversations about God's goodness and the truth from God's word, consistent personal devotion with the Lord all around God's word. That was God's grace to us. A life of exposure to God's trustworthiness fortified us in that moment of tragedy. 
And God's word wasn't more precious in that moment than all of those other countless instances of interaction around it. What do you think about God's word? We'll talk about this more next week. What do you think about the church? God's word reveals that God is trustworthy. Number three, God's word instructs towards righteousness. The third observation regarding the divine provision of God's word is that God's word instructs towards righteousness. There was a temptation to be crippled by the pain and the difficulty of every moment without Caleb, even still. Life has been and is hard. I miss my son. Mundane tasks are emotional roller coasters. When I go to pull out plates for dinner and I repetitively grab six instead of five, it is a heartache. The size of the table that you need eating out, or when someone asks you how many children you have. My dear wife, oh, one of our sons was playing basketball, and first practice with the team, the wife of the coach comes up, and there's another boy on the team named Caleb, and his mom's name is Julie. You can probably see where this is going. Oh, are you Caleb's mom? How do you reply to that? What do you do? Thankfully, my wife composed herself mostly in the sweet mother, as she said, not the one, as Julie said, not the one you're thinking of, but I just lost a son named Caleb. Oh, I'm so sorry. You know, it was so sweet, and God was so kind in that moment. But these everyday instances that you go through, how do you know what to do? Everything is different without him. Everything is hard. The first shower after Caleb passed was difficult for me as I cleaned myself up. Every shower after, for two weeks, I couldn't hold it together. I would break down sobbing, and even now there are many things that are emotionally difficult. What do you do with that? What do you do when everything is hard? Typically, I go towards what's not hard, but when everything in front of you is difficult, what do you do? How do you know what to do? How do you take a step forward when you don't know which way is up and which way is down? Well, you have and you turn to God's word. He hasn't left us to ourselves to figure it out. God's word instructs towards righteousness, towards what is right, toward what is good, towards what is pleasing to him. And God's word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. And God's word gives perfect direction as to which way is forward when you can't tell which way is up or down. Julie and I resolved from the very moment after Caleb passed that we would not let hard dictate what we do or don't do. What did that look like in those first moments? I think one of the first things I did when they told me that Caleb was unrevivable was I went and got us bottles of water. <laughs> we, got a long, we got a long haul here. We need to make sure we're hydrated. And we forced ourselves to eat. We forced ourselves to pray. We forced ourselves to thank God for the tremendous gift that Caleb was. We forced ourselves to make phone calls where you have to break the news that he's gone. We forced ourselves to open up our lives to the church and beyond. Why? Because it's the right thing to do before the Lord. And if our hope is in our strength, then everything would be hopeless because everything is hard. But because our hope is in God's strength and God's faithfulness, it doesn't matter how hard something is. What is right? Because he will grant to me what I need to be faithful to him. What a gift from the Lord to know such things, to have confidence in such things. And it only, it only comes because of the word of God. 
Julie and I resolved to not let hard or not hard be the guide of what we would do or don't do. We would not be driven by our feelings, by what is right or not right. Hard is not bad. That's a refrain in our home frequently. Man, this is really hard. Yep, remember, hard's not bad. Yep, okay, good, thanks. What is the next right thing? What would worship look like right now? That's what we want. What would yielding to the Lord look like right now? The truth of Proverbs 3, 5 through 8. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. It will be healing for your body and refreshment to your bones. Those, I preached this passage. Do you remember that? <laughs> I had no idea what the Lord was going to bring my way. And yet that promise that it will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Listen, I think the last thing we emotively wanted to do was turn away from ourselves and to God. There were lots of things that we could want to turn to to find comfort and healing. What is the thing that God says here will bring that? Trusting in the Lord, not leaning on your own understanding, acknowledging Him, following His paths that He has made straight, not being wise in our own eyes, fearing the Lord and turning away from evil. And it has. It has been healing for us. What would bring healing to our body and refreshment to our bones? Not being wise in our own eyes, not thinking we know best or our feelings are trustworthy, right? That's the temptation. God, why would you allow this? I know better than you. I have refused to make such a statement. It is foolishness to ever conclude that we would know better than God. And I speak to myself like this. Don't do it. (laughs) Don't go there. It's not that I don't have the temptation to think that. I think every day at some point I've thought, God, why? No, don't do it. (laughs) Josh, don't. Don't go there. It's foolishness. Do not be a fool. So we fight what we feel with what we know from God's word. What if I don't feel like going to church? It doesn't matter. Don't trust your feelings. What's right? What if I don't feel like considering others' needs above my own? (laughs) Don't do it. Don't not consider others' feelings above your own. Consider others. You're not the only one hurting. Julie and I aren't the only one who experienced a loss. We experienced a great loss. Children lost siblings. Uncles lost nephews. Grandparents lost grandchildren. Friends lost friends. Don't run away and hide. What's right? We need to serve. We need to love. We need to be with God's people. I don't feel like rejoicing right now. I feel like complaining. Well, what does Philippians 2.14 tell us? Do all things without grumbling or disputing. I'm not going to complain about the loss of my son. I'm not going to argue with God about this. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 tells us to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, in everything to give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And we have not been at a loss for things to thank God for in Caleb's passing. Starting the night after Caleb passed, the first night we spent time talking praying, just trying to uncover what people saw and what they were feeling. But every night after that for two months, month and a half, something like that, we took significant time and just shared what we were thankful for about Caleb every night. We would not disobey this passage when it came to Caleb. We will thank the Lord in the loss of Caleb. And we are going to remember the gift of Caleb and praise God for him. We didn't lose something that was rightfully ours. We were given something we never deserved. 
Caleb was a tremendous gift. And we will not dishonor the Lord through a spirit of entitlement when what we have been given is far greater than we deserved. Easier is not better. The thought that something is hard and so it's not right, or the thought that that something is easier so it is right, those are just vain promises. If you think, I'm going to do this because it's easier and this thing is hard so I'm not going to do it, if that's how you make spiritual decisions, you are going to be greatly disappointed. Every promise that something wrong is easier is a vain promise that will not deliver. Obedience to God always delivers. If you walk in truth, you will never be disappointed. You will never be disappointed with what God does and how God uses it. We were not left directionless. God's word instructed us towards righteousness. What a gift that is. Lastly, God's word reveals the abundant provisions of God. There have been many moments, many, many moments where I felt like I was hanging on by a thread. But I would say, it's God's thread and it will not fail. God's provisions are not simply adequate. They are abundant. Shortly after Caleb's passing, things were a bit of a blur and we were simply trying to navigate each day. We couldn't get much beyond that. Yet the reality that God had given to us mercies for that day and his mercies would be new that next morning, it was such a comfort to us. Every night as we prayed as a family, we would pray that thank you for your mercies today which have sustained us and thankful and thank you for the ones that will be new in the morning which we know will not fail. Lamentations 3 22 and 23, the Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases, for his compassions or mercies never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God is great. He is always faithful. And just... just Ponder, as I read some passages, what God reveals about his own faithfulness to care for his children. 2 Peter 1.3 says, Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. How do we get that true knowledge of him? Through his word. Through our Bibles. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, I referenced it earlier. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you'll be able to endure it. What a provision from the Lord. Romans 8, 31 and 32, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? And those all things are all things that we need to be conformed into his likeness and pleasing to him in godliness. The abundant provisions of the Lord are precious. How especially precious is the abundant provision of God's Son in the gospel that we might be reconciled to him. Consider Colossians 1, 19 and 20, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross through him. I say whether things on earth or things in heaven, in Ephesians 1, 5 through 8, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him, that is Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. The night Caleb passed, Julie and I wept in our bed pretty much the whole night. I think we both got about two 30-minute stints where we were half asleep, half awake. 
to say it lightly, we were in emotional agony. We would talk and cry and pray and cry and repeat. Our resounding prayer was, Lord, this cost of Caleb's life is high. Don't, please, please, Lord, don't let us squander what you would want to do in us and through us. Sustain us in our belief that we can trust you, and if we were strengthened in our faith, and maybe just one person was sustained in the faith as a result of our circumstances, Lord, it would be worth it. The truth is, if we saw no fruit come from Caleb's passing, God would be no less wise, no less good, no less righteous, no less worthy of submission and honor and worship. God would still be undeniably good and trustworthy. And yet our humble plea was, use this. Don't let it be in vain. And what a gift. What what could a father and mother want more for their duration of their child's life, for the duration of their child's life, than for it to bring glory to God? So God, please use this for your glory. That was our cry. That continues to be our refrain. Caleb's passing was fairly graphic, and the biblical imagery of blood, particularly Christ's blood, has taken on a more personal impact for us. That night we were in agonizing zeal, pleading with God to not let Caleb's blood be poured out in vain. That we would not squander it. It was precious to us. Shortly after that first night, Julie and I came to the wonderful realization that while Caleb's blood was precious to us, it was nothing compared, nothing compared to the precious blood poured out of our Savior. And far too often have we been complacent and squandered his blood in spiritual complacency and apathy or even defiance. Our cry has been expanded beyond the cry to not squander Caleb's blood, but much more so, Lord, let us not squander the blood of your son, which is far more precious than the blood of our son. So we wrap up, consider 1 Peter 1, 17 through 21. If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers. But how were you redeemed? With precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless. The blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. What a gift! What a gift is Christ Jesus, and an offering was his sacrifice, and what a faith and hope we can have. And do have because of Christ, because of his precious blood being spilled. Have you ever done your daily Bible reading, your devotion time in scripture and thought, well, I'm glad I did that, but I just didn't get a lot out of it today? I have in the past. And what a narrow view of God's truth that reveals I had no idea how God was going to use a life of consistent exposure to his word. When we didn't have the strength to speak, God used his word as it flooded our hearts and minds to sustain us in our despair and to catapult us into worship and to the pursuit of godliness. To a desire for his glory over our comfort. God's word was nourishment for our soul. When we were reduced to putty, God used his word like tender hands forming a pot as he was molding us tenderly into useful vessels. 
When our trial was most intense and most severe, God's word was and is more valuable and more precious than anything else. And this is not only true of the divine provision of God's word when things are tragic and hard. This is the reality of God's word every single moment of every single day. This is a precious provision, a divine provision. We need it. We benefit from it every day. Are you in Christ? Do you have access to this divine provision? Because this world is filled with troubles and sorrows and difficulties and trials. And even more so, You are filled with sin. And there is no remedy. There is no reprieve. There is no comfort. There is no joy for you outside of this God that truly will sustain you in joy and contentment and hope. I would plead with you, don't wait another moment to humble yourself before God. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Reject yourself. Turn to Christ. There is an unshakable hope that is found in him. Know the gospel. Read your Bible. Learn about God. And if you're in Christ, do not squander the precious blood of our, of our Savior through apathy. Know God's word for the trouble that's coming, but for the joy of today. It wasn't like this this lifeless um, routine of reading God's word with joylessness for 20 years and then the trial hit and whoa, God's word's really amazing. God's word has been so faithful and a source of joy and contentment for years and years and years and as all the things that might compete with him in my life were stripped away, God's word remained and is faithful and is a means to being able to honor him and glorify him, which is a privilege beyond all measure. God has dealt generously with us. He has granted to us a divine resource in his word. Let us embrace it and praise him for it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for scripture. Thank you for the reality that you can sympathize with us in our weakness. You can tend to us so abundantly. You grant to us supernatural things in life's hardships that have no explanation than the faithfulness of a good God. Thank you. Help us to be faithful before you as we embrace these generous resources that you've given to us in yourself and then through a true knowledge of you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.